A very good afternoon and welcome back to the Touchline on Y254. My name is Max Olwasike. This time round, we're speaking about the sponsorship of Kenyan football following the announcements by Football Kenya Federation President Nick Mwendwa, especially with regards to broadcasts and uh, television deals for KPL and <coughs> National Super League, of course, which are first and second tier, respectively. I'm talking to this tallest man in the house, <laughs> Barry Sila, a sports journalist, alongside Ronnie Aloyo, a sports consultant. It's been a while, man. Where have you been? <laughs> Ronnie, man. I haven't seen you in a while. I think the last time we saw each other is a year ago. Yeah, it's been a minute, but you know, it's sports and also just trying to find our way in the market. Yeah, but I'm happy to be back. Good to uh, uh, know that you are doing uh, good things outside there, sports related, <laughs> of course. Just ensuring that, you know, we get to another level as far as growth and development of our game. How has it been like? Tough I, I, mean, I mean, it's important, but then uh, football, particularly in Kenya, it's a tough sport. Um, the stakeholders are also not doing enough to help the sports grow. Uh, government is doing its part, but uh, I don't think it's also enough to take football and sports generally to the next level. And uh, one of the biggest concerns, as you've earlier pointed out in the show, is the issue of sponsorship because that's what drives uh, growth in sports. Uh, then the other thing is investment in facilities like stadium. And uh, as the joke goes, the famous Camarini Stadium is yet to be done. <laughs> <laughs> in the next seven years. <laughs> Barry, yes, how about yes. yourself? I'm you know, uh, with COVID pandemic here, mm. with us hitting a lot of people, mm. I've seen you gaining weight, contrary <laughs> to expectation. <laughs> well, as people continue to get emaciated because of hard living, Yours is... <laughs> <laughs> so, like Ronnie, I think we all miss sports. We wanted to come back. Uh, President Uru the other day uh, directed the ministry to fast track the process of getting back to sports. Sport activities has, has stalled, and uh, I think it's important that we get back so that uh, we get going. You remember things like qualifiers are around the corner for football, African qualifiers. If we are not practicing, we have a, uh, we have a friendly with Zambia, I think, in the next uh, few weeks. We have not done anything. So people are desperate to get back and so are we, so that we give coverage as well. And I was in Sharks during the last few weeks and people are just playing. Mm -hmm. uh, football is there, people are passionate about uh, the game, people are playing, yeah. despite the fact that Amina Mohammed said, you know, yeah. those outdoor mm -hmm. sports disciplines that involve a lot of people coming together yeah. should not be resumed. I think what's happening is that uh, people, Even in are, estates, yeah, people, people are, are tired of waiting. And yes. I think some people are also picking up from what politicians are doing. They're busy meeting up everywhere, but them, they can't do anything. So I think it's also, they don't have capacity to check everywhere. People are playing and football will go on and sports will go on. The only thing Amina needs to do now is to open. Sure. Do you agree that Amina should open? Yeah, but then obviously with caution, you know, yeah. we just can't throw caution to the wind. Yeah. I mean, there is... Um, uh, concerns about COVID uh, 2.0 coming again uh, in the in the US, for instance. I mean, it's gotten to the highest office possible, and we don't want that to happen here. Yes, in as much as we also want sports to be back, we also got to ensure that we like just maintain the protocols. But uh, important to mention for our ambassadors, uh, mm -hmm. the minister said that she'll offer them as much support as possible, so they can also start preparing for the qualifiers. They have a friendly against Zambia in a couple of weeks and also the qualify against Comoros, mm -hmm. then again another return leg. So, I mean, for Arambistas particularly, um, a good number of players have been away for a, cup, a bunch of months actually and it's going to be interesting to see what happens, especially now that they've not been actively playing. Mm -hmm. Let's just pick it from where you've left. Talking about Arambistas, the national team assignments against Zambia in a friendly clash, and uh, African Cup of Nations qualify against Comoros. We saw the provisional squad being named by the head coach, yeah. Francis Kimanzi, and, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> exciting names, yeah. notable inclusions, yeah. and uh, quite surprise omissions. Yeah. Arnold Origi, the former goalkeeper, yeah. after several years not yeah. playing for the national team, yeah. is making a comeback. Yeah. Close to four years. Close I mean. to four years. Yeah. Is, is his inclusion necessary? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think, uh, yes, uh, Kimanzi, this is it's called a provisional squad, but we have to realize Arnold had made a decision to quit, and now he's back, I think, because of his showing. And we have also had a big problem in that department of goalkeeping. You, you realize even Matasi, who helped us some time back, is not, not even in the squad. 
So I think it's bringing in experience uh, so that to boost the confidence of the other keepers on the side. But if you asked me, uh, I don't think it was necessary for, for Arnold to come back. A uh, goalkeeping crisis, as Barry is indicating, is it true that uh, there is a lacuna as far as a man standing between the goalposts for the national team around the is concerned? We have the legs of Ian Otieno, yeah, yeah, yeah. who has been doing pretty yes, good job so in Zambian to have Premier League. Yeah. And uh, of course, was it, was it necessary to exclude Patrick Matazi? On what basis? Um, well, yes and no, because... Matasi came in was obviously the main, uh, the number one keeper going into Afcon. Um, had instances where he played well, yes. like saved uh, some penalties at Afcon, but mm -hmm. then he also had some howlers there. <laughs> so now the question is, well, it's actually not a question. It goes without saying that with the Rigi coming back, he's obviously going to be the number one keeper because Matasi's backup, mm -hmm. Farouk Shikalo, who plays for Yanga, mm -hmm. is not in the squad anymore. Mm -hmm. So. Obviously, Orig is coming in for the number one position. I've seen opinion on social media. Some fans are saying, okay, that uh, Kimanzi is favoring his people, uh, his people being the likes of Arnold Origi. But if you look at the matches in Finland, Origi is playing. Mm -hmm. He's played even this week. He's, he's looking good. He's looking solid. At 36 years, if I'm not wrong, a uh, good age for a keeper, has good, good experience. But then the big question is, what does that put? Uh, potent for or what does that or where does that put uh, the local goalkeepers you know um, they probably will say okay uh, I'm working hard then Rigi just comes and take my, takes my position mm, it's also a question of merit and experience I yes. just don't know but it's mm. a tough balance mm. um, I just wish Kimanzi would maintain some consistency in goal the factors that might have uh, been put into consideration before naming the provisional squad, yeah. considering uh, during coronavirus pandemic, a lot mm. of mm. players mm. haven't been active, you mm. know, training, mm. engaging in fitness mm. uh, exercises. Mm. What do you think he based on before naming those players? We've also seen standard practice internationally, even mm. the likes of Gareth Southgate yeah. calling their squads mm. ahead of assignments for mm. national team football mm. competitions. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> what are I, the factors? I, I think this one, uh, it caught everyone, uh, you know, off guard, including the coach himself. So I, I, I suspect uh, to a large extent he wanted to, to, to you know, get players who had, had done the shot before. If you look at maybe Lawrence, uh, Muguna, uh, so, some of these key players who were, even in Sekafa matches, uh, tournaments they played, and in AFCON, uh, they were there as fringe players, but now what needs to happen? What happened is, if you look at that squad as well, we have people who are now regularly playing Olunga, Victor Wanyama, so as to mix with these other guys who probably are only training at home because the, we are not no, no training is happening. So it's it's a bit of a tough balancing act for for Kimanzi, but uh, let's see. It, it's it's even interesting to see um, new interesting names like Clark Odor from Barnsley. Some of these guys who have not really played. And I think he scored yesterday. Yeah, he scored, yeah. So, if you look, I think what Kimanzi is trying to do, get as much as people who have played and mix with these guys and try to balance a team, in my view. So we should leave the coach to do his <laughs> job without uh, poking <laughs> holes and scrutinizing <laughs> what he's doing. His hands are tied. Because, as, 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 as they always as, say, yeah. the coaching selection is final. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just like what happened before African Cup of Nations, where yeah. Sebastian Mini yeah. did some mistakes, you mm. know, meeting the likes of Anthony Akumu yeah. and uh, a lot of uh, complaints yeah. on social media platforms mm. that, you know, this is the player who deserved an inclusion, he's been left out, and we were told by the federation mm. selection is a responsibility of the coach, yeah. the head coach should yeah. do his job. Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. As, uh, as someone, as I think Jose Mourinho says that. Um, some 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 people like myself who criticize coaches the more have never kicked a ball, <laughs> and yeah, it could be true. <laughs> but then we also got to give an opinion yeah. about it because it's our team, and uh, we cannot go without pointing out uh, some some important issues. But Origi's experience, if you look at his generation, he's been one keeper who's been very consistent over the years. Uh, he. During his generation, you can name uh, Duncan Ocheng, yes. Wilson Oburu. Yeah. I mean, a lot of other goalkeepers, but none of them match the consistency and the hard work and the talent that uh, Origi displayed. So for me, 
yeah, he's been playing and he's a good addition to the team despite all the other issues. And Kenya used to be boastful <coughs> of having potential talents mm. as far as goalkeeping department is concerned during the those days of Mohamud Abbas, of course, mm -hmm. we didn't happen to watch him, but those yeah. who got an opportunity to see him between the goalposts say mm -hmm. he was heroic and mm -hmm. his exploits are well remembered. Mm -hmm. We had, you know, the likes of Francis Onyiso, mm -hmm. uh, Matthew Otomax, mm -hmm. Victor Onyango, Onyango mm -hmm. you know, Noah Yuko, yeah. who is not doing very well, but we hope yeah. he will get to the bottom of what he's going through. Yeah. I don't know, what went wrong? Um... <sighs> Honestly, it's, it's a really tough question because if, if you look back, there are lots of young keepers who came through the ranks, you know. Even during Matasi's time, yes. when he was rising at AFC, then just something dipped. Uh, there was Mboya of Tasca, who mm. at one point at Madare. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking that probably it's an issue with coaching. It could be an issue with coaching, you know, but mm. because... There are so many young, talented keepers, but then it just gets to a point you don't see the best of them. Sure. There was a keeper at FC Leopards went to task, I think. Martin uh, Musali. Uh -huh. There was even Martin Musali. You know. uh, there hasn't been consistency. A keeper rises for about a season, yes. then fizzles out. So mm -hmm. for me, it's an issue of, uh, of coaching. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, uh, the national team had Ed Salim, who went to Simba, mm -hmm. a, a fairly good coach. So I just, I just don't know, but... My, my bet is that it's an issue with coaching that we just have not gotten it right uh, with goalkeeping coaches. Barry, who is your standout inclusion in the team? Maybe someone that caught your attention and are very deserving. Let's leave those people who've been making the team day in, day out. Mm. Just a debutant in the team and totally deserving case. Uh, I think I'd go with uh, what is the... the First of all, uh, the, the, the surprise exclusion, I, I still insist, is uh, just a very... He doesn't go for the national team, but I think it's a valuable asset. But for me, the, I think f uh, the, the defender who went to go, Andrew Juma, Roma. Yes. Yeah, he's, for me, he's a top, top quality defender who is going to... If he plays, he can help him with Joshua, Joshua Nyango. I think Roma is, is a good inclusion. Yeah. But then also, it's important to, to point out that, well, there is possibility that uh, Wanyama, uh, Johanna Omolo and uh, Olunga might not be coming in mm -hmm. because of the uh, COVID protocols in their countries. So we most likely are going to see them uh, feature in this one. Mm -hmm. But uh, the national team has reported they're trying to do everything in their, in, their, uh, in their capacity to ensure that the three fly in. But then regard regardless, uh, whether they come in or not, I feel we have uh, we have a good team though the biggest question for kenya will be the experience not mm -hmm. many players have been playing mm -hmm. uh, it's been about 6 months and uh, i think missing the three will be a big blow also mm -hmm. robert maebo co-host is watching and far away due to other engagement saying good to see ronnie and barry back no matter what the grapevine says it's good that football in kenya has got sponsorships great show see you next week good to hear from you man so uh, let's now, Osor is making us to switch yeah. and speak about the sponsorships. Media and broadcast deal from Star Times as announced by FKF Supremo Nick Mwenpo for the next seven years now. Yeah, yeah. Kenyan football mm. will not be in the dark. Mm. Good move? Excellent move, though some people people still insist Nick, uh, Nick Mwenpo runs the federation like his house. <laughs> um, but it's, it's about time... Uh, because since Supersport left a few years back, it's about time we went back to, to, to TV. Remember, this is one of the platforms that uh, markets our players. Uh, so if you're on TV, definitely is ex good exposure, good visibility for, for, for the players. Number two, money will be creeping to the clubs, money will be creeping into the players' pockets. Hopefully there are structures for that. And this is what has been lacking for a very long time. And since Star Times assigned, uh, I think it's Umonga, seven years, whatever. Uh, one ten million. One, but though for me, one ten looks a bit tiny uh, for because it's national team, NSL, KPL, women's team. I don't know how it will be subdivided. But it's a good move uh, for a start uh, that you're back to TV and money will be coming back to, to football and coming back to the plus. For me, that's an excellent move from the Federation. Yes. Excellent move, as Barry says, but legitimacy, <laughs> you know, Kenyan football following, as usual, raising questions on whether this deal is genuine or otherwise? Well, both you and I and the three of us, we really can't tell. 
uh, the genuity of the deal. But you know, it's it's the nature of football <laughs> in Kenya that everything is shrouded in secrecy. Mm -hmm. But for Nick, it makes good for political mileage at this point, particularly ahead of the elections. Yeah, mm -hmm. the elections are just uh, in the corner. <clears throat> Though, if you look at the money uh, for all the leagues and the national team, I'd say it's not sufficient because. Uh, it's not Star Times are actually airing. Star Times are just broadcasting, but yes. then FKF are producing. Yeah, mm -hmm. are producing those matches. So that. Uh, so if you look at the cost of production as well, uh, then you look at what goes into <laughs> the team's pockets. I'd say it's if you break it down, it's meager. Yeah. It's meager. Yeah, it's meager because our production for about. 50, at least 50 matches. Because a, you have to have season. an OB van and I think yeah. the production crew mm -hmm. and yeah, the whole team involved. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's damn expensive to be honest. And at the end of the day, I don't think the teams are going to make much out of it. But then something else that also caught my attention is uh, uh, the, the president said that, look, we are going to air the matches online, uh, which, is, which is a good thing. But then you have to pay 200 shillings to watch this. I mean... Uh, sorry, Nick, but then just doesn't make any financial sense. Mm. I mean, 200 shillings to watch uh, a league that's barely struggle, struggling to be a third-grade uh, third league mm. <laughs> just doesn't make sense. To be I was talking to some promising young man, an upcoming footballer, William Mutuku, yeah. who is currently training with Task FC, yes. and he was telling me, you know, the way he talks to his friends and, you know, the way Nick Mwendo was telling us about uploading a Star Times application with mm -hmm. which you can watch football. And as Ronnie puts it, for you to do that, mm -hmm. I think you have to pay around 100 bob, 200 bob. Yeah, yeah. So his friends were like, come on, mm -hmm. I can't pay 200 bob yeah. to watch a Kenyan Premier League match. Yeah. Because for them, I think EPL is the most lucrative. How well would mm -hmm. the FKF convince... <laughs> Uh, uh, I think football I th supporters yeah. locally that you know yeah. it's right for them continue having massive yeah, following I, for I th I think their like, local brand. Like what Ronnie said, it's not viable. Uh, remember, we are still obsessed with foreign leagues, and uh, I think to some extent there's a lot of uh, penetration of internet in the country, but still affordability is an issue. So to tell uh, a random football uh, whatever fan that you're going to pay 100 or 200 per match, which is not quality. I don't even... There is um, no symbiosis yeah, yeah, value yeah, for yeah. your money. Yeah, it's no value for money. And in any case, I, I still think uh, they'll, they'll do another approach where they'll probably bring in numbers by uh, probably doing it for free. It, uh, if you get big numbers, then uh, you have uh, power to negotiate for bigger sponsorship from other people or from the same people, from the same organization. So for me, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, to be, to be honest, if, if you look at last season where some matches were being aired on Facebook, the mm. average audience was 500 people. Mm. I mean, no sensible company would yeah. want to yeah. advertise to 500, 500 people. <laughs> there are lots of influencers online who yeah. command a solid yeah. 5,000 people yeah. per, per live session, yeah. you know. Yeah. Mm. So to make it was FKF want to bill it and say pay 200 shillings or 100 shillings, mm. And that's less cost of data, you know, because you need about 500 MBs yeah. to stream these matches. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a question of also how viable are some of these projects. They might look very good on the surface. I mean, very pleasing and very exciting for the mouth. But then at the end of the day, the money doesn't trickle down to mm -hmm. the people who matter the most. And that's the players. I, uh, maybe to add a bit on that. Yes. I think the, the Federation should uh, maybe work with experts like our guy here. I do not think in the Federation they have technical capacity to probably understand or, uh, you know, understand basically how football marketing works uh, or sports marketing as a whole works. So if, if they work to the experts, they would break it down to Are them. Are they willing in the first place? I don't know. They'll break it down <laughs> and tell them, this is what works. You need to start from somewhere, start down going up. Uh, instead of a, it needs to be bottom up, not top down approach. That's my. We've been in this studio with Ronnie and you for mm -hmm. you know quite uh, several times, and we've been discussing about state of Kenyan football, mm -hmm. and we won't get tired, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, talking about it to ensure that you know we get to another level as far as growth and development of the game. Yeah. But you know this game of back and forth, it looks like it's musical chairs again mm -hmm. between the KPL. And mm -hmm. Football Kenya Federation, we've seen Jack Oguda insisting that they are still in charge. They are the ones who are mandated to run and manage 
top tier that is Kenyan Premier League while FKF is saying they have renamed mm -hmm. the top tier to be yeah. FKF Premier League which yeah. will be managed and ran yeah. by uh, a team that they will be selecting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where are we heading man? Well I'm not uh, Nick Mwendo's biggest cheerleader but <laughs> I think Jack Oguda has been there for quite some time at KPL. He's and had nothing it, much. Yeah and really now there isn't much I mean I'm sure the accounts are dry and probably in the in the red at <laughs> KPL. So I, I don't see the need of Jack continuing insisting that he should uh, uh, continue running football. Uh, well, give it up to Nick. Yes, he has his shortcomings, but uh, something has changed. There are at least two sponsors who've come in, uh, Star Times and uh, Bet King, who we hear are the main league sponsors. And uh, KPL has nothing to show for it, you know. You just want the league, you want the property, but then you can't take care of it. So, I mean, it's time to to change to change uh, the people who run the league. Let's give it to a different body. I mean, KPL's mandate was ending on September the 24th. Mm -hmm. That that period has already elapsed. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see what FKF can now do. Hopefully, uh, going by the signs, they, they've at least secured two, what I can say, crucial sponsorships. So let's see how it goes. We all know that FKF is, you know, the overall governing body yes. of football in the country, which means they oversee all activities pertaining Kenyan mm. soccer. And therefore, <laughs> they can do what they wish. Mm. I don't know. Are you reading from the same script? Uh, only that I'd say let's give it to FKF this I'd time round to manage and run. I say the biggest challenge that, or the biggest problem that many stakeholders have had with the federation and the president per se is lack of inclusion or lack of stakeholder engagement. Uh, some of these things, the biggest stakeholders of the game are the players and the clubs. And to a large extent, I'm not sure if they were fully... How about the fans? Uh, and the fans <laughs> as well, yeah. And they were fully involved in, in, in this kind of, uh, you know, uh, um, deal. But, uh, yes, September 24th, the contract ended with the FKF and KPL. And Nick said he'll, they'll take it back. Yes. Uh, but for me, I even in, um, if you look at international practice, I don't know if we can still adapt it here. It's not traditional that the FAs run the top tier leagues. What needs to happen is that the FA should give uh, proper management to an, a structured, well-structured organization to run on their behalf. I would, I, would, I would expect FKF to say FKF, PL, we're going to outsource somebody to run it on our behalf. Yeah. We are the overall managers and everything, but you run it. So that it becomes uh, uh, completely professional. The, 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 the problem with this is that you do not know if FKF can control from the back the management of, they can decide you're the chairman or you, whatever. So for me, that was the only problem. Otherwise, them bringing in sponsors is quite a good, a good move on their behalf. You know, Ronnie, wear many hats, but <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's a sports marketer, he's a sports consultant, he's a sports pundit, mm. and he's also a diehard for FC Leopards. <laughs> now let's talk about, you know, uh, what our local clubs have been doing, especially during this time of coronavirus pandemic, mm. just engaging in training, you know, yeah. fitness yeah. levels ahead of, you know, the 2020-2021 season kickoff. We mm. yet to know the mm. dates, but just hoping that it will be soon. Mm. How is your team doing FC Leopards? You know, Dan Shikanda, <laughs> first of all, let's start from you know the aspect of Dan Shikanda becoming as the chairman. I've seen a lot of reforms in place. Uh, how is it like at the den? I mean, Dan is a, is a serious professional. He's played the game and uh, he's, as a professional, he's qualified in his own right and you've got to give it up to him. He has the passion for the game. And you can see there have been there has been changes at the club. I mean, positive changes, less 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 wrangles, and I mean the team seems to be taking some shape of sorts, and becoming an FC Leopards of 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 old, if I can put it that way. But then yesterday there was some news that were not so good. I mean, with the news that uh, Anthony Kimani is not going to be the head coach anymore. My goodness! And uh, they are bringing in a coach. I'm, I I really can't recall the name, but. Coming in from Botswana, he's been in Botswana before. Uh, his coach, I think, Township Rollers before. So, I mean, fans were saying, look, now you have money and you're trying to get rid of Kimani. A person who has stood by you. 
yeah, during and, tough and, times. Yeah, and a really, really ambitious young man, you know. For sure. Yeah, so, I mean, that's the only question. The club has not come out to clarify why uh, that's happening. But I don't think it's a really good thing because Kimani is uh, he's, he's really working his way up. He's one of those young young people who've played the game just like Mikel Ateta and uh, they want to Frank take Lampard, football yes. yeah, to the next level. So if uh, it's, it's just because they want to bring in a foreign coach, I don't think that's a really uh, good move. What's this appetite of yeah. Kenyan mm -hmm. you know, football administrators mm -hmm. with foreign <coughs> coaches? We know how, how, how exorbitant it is, mm -hmm. you know, hiring a foreign-based coach, yeah. just coming mm -hmm. to coach a Kenyan football club or a rugby club. Mm -hmm. We even saw at the Kenya Rugby Union, they decided to mutually part ways with Paul Finney mm -hmm. and bring on board, you know, Senam Kosimi, mm -hmm. a local-based and very proven yeah. uh, coach. So I think what Ron is saying is very true because I know Modo Kimana at personal level, an excellent mm -hmm. uh, professional, a good-hearted man mm -hmm. and you know, he stood by FC Leopards in tough times and I think it was high time they retained him going forward rather than now that they have money. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe to start with where Ronnie left, uh, the rumours has it that Modo is going for coaching mm -hmm. classes to hire his lesson. Sponsored in by Europe? the yeah, I don't know where, sponsored by the club. So that this guy comes, the guy is a Czech, Czech national. He comes in and temporary, whatever. Or in the acting capacity. Yeah, that, those are the strong rumors. <laughs> Though it, I, I had chairman today uh, refute those claims that as far as he knows, Modo Kiman is still the coach. And uh, until, in his own words, until we post it on our social handles, then all those are rumors. And, and you know, now moving to, to your, your, your question of appetite for, 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 for foreigners, yet we have talent here. And it's ironical because sometimes even the foreigners who come, some are not, as, not as qualified. Yes. And another thing also, we don't even pay have you, have you ever realized that you Google yeah. the profile of that foreign-based coach, <laughs> yeah. then you can't see him anywhere, you can't mm, yeah. and this is why uh, I, see his profile? This is why I agree with Nick Mwendo. He once said, uh, we want every foreigner who's coming to this country. Their credentials must be up to par. They're going to, Federation is setting up to standards, vet. standards vet. So that I think this is a challenge for our local coaches and the challenge also for the Federation. They have to continuously train our coaches to be at this level. We are we're in a very competitive space right now in football management. And therefore, if you can't meet, let's say, UEFA B or UEFA C, uh, you, I don't think you should be in the touchline in my view. So it's a challenge in my view that uh, coaches must always up their game. And the Federation and clubs must invest in that important resource called coach. Well, I honestly feel that the foreign coaches are um, well, they're, they're, they aren't bad uh, overly because they bring in some level of experience and professionalism into the league and uh, they give the players a different perspective, you know. Like one of the better coaches who's been here, Zimaria, a top, top uh, professional in his days and a top coach as well. Uh, someone of that caliber bring, brings in a whole uh, different perspective to the league. But then it's also a question of uh, merging pri pri priorities because the league is not as professional as, as it should be. So then the coach comes in and starts working with almost zero resources. So at the end of the day, you can't expect him to deliver the best that he can. Or you can't expect him to inject that level of professionalism or change into the club yet the club itself is struggling with basic facilities like training, uh, even just paying uh, the coach himself. So, yes, it's important, but then at the end of the day, we also got to give young coaches a chance. A good example, Mikel Ateta. Arsenal realized it late in the day that instead of hiring Unai Emery, they should have hired Ateta yes. in the first place to help with the rebuild, which is now looking really promising. So for me, we should have lots of Anthony Kimanis in the league who are growing with the league, they're ambitious, and within five or so years, just like Piso Mosimane, they can also <laughs> go outside Kenya and coach uh, the Al Alis, mm -hmm. the Zeskos, the Mamelodi Sundowns, you know. But we just can't have Kenyan coaches who are rotating within uh, Kenyan clubs, and at the end of the day, we have the same a uh, level of skill and expertise being rotated amongst the players and no one has that experience of going to coach outside uh, the country. 
So Fadili Atmani, my director, is telling me that we take a short break. But I think I'm pleading with them, we just continue because these are two energetic and muscular duo. We can proceed. So as an insider at Gurmaya Football Club, what's happening? <laughs> uh, I don't know if they All broke. Right. I don't know if they let's broke. Let's discuss them. about that when we come back. Okay. Let's take a short break. Of course, we will be back shortly to continue <laughs> with matters discussion surrounding uh, football. And of course, at the tail end of the show, the fans on where we focus on what's coming up next as far as this Premier League is concerned. <laughs>